Welcome to the Modern Cloister. I'm Carissa and I'm here with Kevin and today we're going to be continuing our series on community. If you were with us last time, you know that we discussed Christian community. We explored what the Bible says about it. We talked about what the early church was like and then also looked through a historical lens of how the church and society evolved over time. Today we're going to continue that series by talking about the decline of community and then next week we'll be talking about the future of community. Today in the decline of community we're going to enter this discussion from two vantage points. We're going to start by looking at society as a whole and community within society from the 1950s to present day in America, and then we're also going to dive in after that into looking at the church specifically within that same time frame and how community existed and also had a similar decline along that time too. To start, we're going to really hone in on what the environment was like in the 1950s. So I'm going to start by Punting this over to Kevin, because he's a lot more familiar with some of the historical and sociological underpinnings that were really present in the 1950s at this peak of society. So Kevin, talk to us a little bit about what life looked like at that time. Yeah, I think there's a reason in in current politics, people have the nostalgia and kind of over, over extending what, what things look like as far as society went, is church being involved in politics and uh, because the 1950s was when we had, and God we trust, added to our money, right? That was also uh, the time that we added one nation under God to the pledge. You know, these these weren't here at those times. And it, it doesn't mean that it wasn't legitimate, you know, but there's certainly the syncretism that we talked about back uh, in the early Christian church as they became the official religion of Rome. Now, it was never an official religion in the United States. The United States, as a federal government, has never had an official religion. But, you know, this was a time where they started the National Prayer Breakfast. So that that's the president of the United States attending a breakfast where, where people prayed. And then there was a broadly Christian evangelical-ish message. Um, one of the most popular movies around the time is The uh, Ten Commandments. And actually, as a publicity stunt, that's when Hollywood went around and put the Ten Commandments out at courthouses, Mm -hmm. uh, which we fight about today as if they've been there for hundreds of years. Um, And if you thought about, you know, what is it? We're we're almost too young to know this. What what are all the 50s movies? The Leave it to Beaver. Oh, don't ask me. That's not my strong suit. (laughs) You don't know 90s movies. I don't don't. know why I'm asking you. Uh, But uh, Ozzy and Harriet, is that a thing? Or are those the parents for someone else? (laughs) So so those are the 50s. And if you think of those people, uh, they were white. Uh, they were Protestant, and, and, and we'll get more into what mainline, I think, means a little bit for people who don't know it. But the idea would be, yeah, that was just part of, of your life, was to be part of the Christian community. Um, it's wild to think in 1960, you know, uh, JFK is running for president, and people were worried he's going to be controlled by the Pope. And we just, uh, we're about a week out of the inauguration of Biden and, you know, he and Pelosi, who's a Democrat, and other Republicans all go to mass together before. I mean, so it's this wild, you know, so like Catholic is, is not a thing. You can't be Catholic. And that's why from our context, we're going to talk about it, it really is a white Protestant thing. Obviously, we're in, we're, there's still segregation, uh, you know, here in Georgia. Uh, schools are still segregated. It would be another 10, 15 years before my alma mater, University of Georgia, allowed black students in. So obviously they're not integrated in society. And, and there's skepticism to Jewish people. Of course, they existed uh, in much smaller numbers than Catholics or, or, or black people. But when you think of the 1950s um, from like what is American, you know, that that's what you're going to get. E- even if it is problematic, we're not saying it's it was this great golden era of, of times. There's obviously issues uh, like we just mentioned, but it, it really was a time when when, like you said, it was peak peak church attendance. So that's when mm-hmm. most people on a Sunday morning would have been at church. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, most white Protestants would have been at uh, some mainline churches. Yeah. So in, in reality, it really was the term cultural Christianity. You could say that that was really some of the first time that that was felt across the country, that they could be looked at as one and the same in a lot of different areas and circles. Yeah. That was probably peak time when people would call themselves Christian. And it's always important to remember more people call themselves Christian than actually attend sure, church, yeah, which is the case now. Been. But yeah. well, this is also, this is also peak time for things like union memberships and civic memberships mm-hmm. and things like that. And so it just became so integrated faith and church and civic life. It just was 
one and the same in a sense. And right. So it really. Yeah. So everyone would have every Sunday been at church for the most part, right? Um, and then also some other time that week, they would have been at the Moose Lodge mm-hmm. or the Shriners. Uh, u- union membership peaked at something like 35, 40% of the workforce. Um, and considering, you know, how many people aren't union, like, you know, how many service jobs there were at the time and how many, uh, there weren't as many women in the workforce, but almost nothing they did was unionize. So this really represented the vast majority of working men and, and what would we would consider the middle class. They, so, you know, and so you'd be at the union hall. Uh, that's where you went to find job postings. That's where you went, some of them to, to drink and hang out afterwards. Um, it was just a very much more connected uh, bowling league, softball leagues. Just you were always around people, really. I mean, there is a very integrated. So we kind of have two parts of the '50s. One is vast majority, you know, white Protestants. People call themselves Christian, and on the other hand, just it's a, a cohesive society. Everyone's involved in probably at least two things: as, a, as either you know, a social club, a church, a union. They're going to be involved. Even even politics really start to take off here. Yeah. It's really interesting then to to transition as we start talking about the next couple of decades and some of the contributing factors that led to that going away over time. And so there's a couple ones that we've picked out that we think are particularly interesting. But And and we talked about this even in preparing for, for this conversation, that there have been so many papers and dissertations and research studies around some of these elements that if this piques your interest, there's a ton of learning that can happen in different areas. But... We, even even popular books too. The, one of the most famous, uh, at least when I was in grad school, it's almost twenty years old now. Uh, but it's called Bowling Alone. Since I mentioned bowling leagues, by uh, Robert Putnam, who you know I don't know actually what he is—a sociologist, maybe a political scientist. I believe he's at Harvard, and he tracked the decline, you, you know, of civil uh, civil organizations, and you know, you know, he's using bowling. I don't know what percentage of people were bowling in the 50s, but apparently it's much, much less in the 90s when he's doing his research. It must have been at least high enough in the 50s to warrant a book title. Well, and you know, it's in this one, well, this is going to be way too tangent. I already see you looking at me, but look at old, look at old shows like the Flintstones that are always bowling and Roseanne and all those, like when you represented, uh, you know, just a typical middle-class white family, they were bowling. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I grew up bowling, so I don't know. Right. Yeah. That's a whole different story. We'll sure, have to go sure. into it at some point when you had to come meet all my folks. In the we South, we got to together. play outside instead of being snowed it's in true. for four months. We did but... do that in, in, in the winter. Bring us, but bring us back anyway, home. Anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to bring us back to where we were going. And that's really discussing some of those main things that we're going to pull out today to point to that we've identified as some of the key factors for how some of this society infrastructure started declining um, after the 1950s into the present day. And so the first couple ones are a lot about the people that were involved. And so we're going to talk about things like suburbanization and the nuclear family and some of the things that happened there. And again, this is really an area that you ended up studying a lot in school, but still have a lot of connection to in what in what you do for work and just some of your, your conversations and study in that sense. So when you talk about suburbanization, walk us through and walk our listeners through what happened from that point on to bring us to where we are today. Sure. So there's two, man, make it brief. There's a whole dissertation. I spent two years studying this in grad school. That's why so I let's told say... everybody. We're not, we're not looking for that. We're looking for the highlights. So two, two quick things. One, one is going to be the ubiquity of the automobile, right? So now all of a sudden you don't have to walk to work. People still did, of course, the peak cities, you know, New York City population peaked in 1920s and Chicago and then 40, 50. Uh, so plenty of people still walking to work, but, you know, you used to be relying on uh, walking. So that was your distance. You lived 15 minutes, so maybe a uh, quarter mile from work. And then trains, when those first and trolleys, buses, when, you know, those sort of things, you're going to live a couple miles away. But with a car, even when the roads were kind of rudimentary by our, our current standards, you could still go 20 minutes away. You could be 10 miles away or farther. So you start building houses. Uh, but with that, was still really just on the high end. You had to be relatively well off until after World War II. One of the things was the GI Bill, where the government actually got into the, not business, but the, the idea of promoting home ownership. So they just straight out gave people uh, money for down payments in some instances. But the biggest thing was backing loans. So mortgages used to not be 30-year fixed rate that were guaranteed by the government. And so now people could afford homes. 
and homes are much more affordable and you could go out and just buy these large tracts of land as efficiency and machination came to farms. So, you know, you go back 150 years, 60, 70% of people worked on farms, right? And then in the 20s, kind of that era leading up into the Great Depression, it was 33, 35%. In the 40s and 50s, which was really the auto boom, the war effort, the industrial, you know, complex, uh, we dropped down to about 15%. And today we're about 2 or 3%. So, some of that farmland would naturally just be sold off because you didn't need anymore because you could be so efficient. And then you'd sell it off, you'd buy houses, and then you'd build roads out there, and people just started going out there. And this really was exasperated, and I'll wrap it up with this, with the uh, Eisenhower built the interstates. These were meant to be evacuation in times of uh, war or distress or nuclear attack. Instead, it became commuter routes because mm-hmm. you could funnel massive amount of people just straight out of the city and out into the suburbs. Yeah, so all of these elements really took the center of community life from those, those, I guess, overlap points where everyone, mm-hmm. it, you know, to, to your point before, that you, you lived and worked within a mile or two of everyone that you lived with, everyone that was around you. And so you, your life was probably within a square mile or two, whereas now mm-hmm. you could really go out miles and miles from where you live. Like you could work 60 miles like people do today from where... Oh gosh, like yeah, you, at least. 60 miles between where you live and where you work. And then you could have another 20 miles in a different direction for where you would go to church or where your family would live mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And so as our families were doing that and moving across, there was also this this shift within the nuclear family of people starting to move farther and farther away from each other. And so there's two things that really started happening there too, along with the people component. There was changes to how the nuclear family um, was existing for some different um, points along the way, and we'll get into those, but then there was also this geographic mobility. So do you want to take us through some of the changes to the the nuclear family that happened, and then I can walk us through some geographic mobility type things? Yeah, I'd I'd say there's two parts for the family. One is the uh, number of children, uh, you know, I, I don't, we probably should have looked this up, but I th- want to say about a hundred years or so ago, people were having, you know, five or six kids, certainly in the, five or six. <laughs> yeah. Certainly you go back to the, to the rural. Well, I mean, of, of my grandparents, I think five or six is the smallest. And my, my mom's dad was one of 13. And so when you were in the rural areas, for sure, um, you know, cities, people would obviously have less, but you know, when you worked out on the farm, you needed labor. And so you had more kids. Uh, So part of that was the shift to that. Um, Part of that was the efficiency. You know, you don't need three boys now that that plow the fields or drive mules. One person can now do it in one tractor. Mm -hmm. So maybe you just have less. And and that sounds like a strange way to think about it, but that's kind of just the way it was. And then there's the optimism of the economy. And so the, the, the place is booming. Everyone has just moved out of the city. Everyone lives in these, you know, um, Levitt towns and, and these other new homes and have these good paying union jobs. And so I think the average in the, the even in the 60s was like 3.6, you know, pushing four kids per home. And that's, you know, either blue collar guys who can afford their family or even a lot of the white collar still having three, four kids per family. Uh, so you have that. But then in the 70s is when no fault divorce becomes. Uh, but before that, you would have to have divorce. Uh, what's that movie where the guy's a private detective? You I know? don't know. Again with the movies. Why okay, are you asking me on. about it's the movies? The, the guy and then the Australian guy. Well, anyway, he talks about the fact that he's losing a lot of business because he because of no-fault divorce. Because mm-hmm. you had to have a reason. And someone basically had to be cheating on you. And then you both had to consent to it in most places. Without that, now people can just leave their families. Or if they're unhappy, they instead of working on it, they can split. Of course, we know there's there's abuse and there's a lot of issues. So this was good for some people. But in general, you know, the divorce rate went from something like 10% to about half or roughly 40% for first marriages. So you're just not having that cohesion. And something we were talking about the other day is if if you're one of four and then you probably have three kids or four kids, all of your siblings also have three or four kids and so and also you live in the suburb now the kind of entering suburb and so there's you and uh you know you got your brother and your sister and and of course your spouse has three or four kids and there's 20 cousins and so there's just a very enmeshed feeling in the society kind of like we were talking about earlier with that that community around you you know you're going to be roughly the same income you may all be you know 
German immigrants or Polish immigrants are maybe starting to merge. You may be all union or maybe you're all white collar who take the train into the city. It's that kind of... And so the, the nuclear family starts to drop where people have less. And I believe a couple years ago now, the there is no majority family, but I think the uh, family that's most common, so it's not 50%, but it's the plurality, is um, single moms. And so it's really hard as a single mom, uh, you know, to be involved in society and to be involved in the things. Um, but then that moved on, you know, to, to move on from there, we had uh, geographic mobility. Yeah, and I'm a great example of what that has really looked like. You know, we we talked a little bit about the ability of, of people to start moving farther and farther away from city centers, but really over those couple of decades, cross-country travel became so much easier for, you know, regular Americans that you would start going across the country for school and for work. And so there was this further disintegration of of community as the center of life. And I mean, that's basically my story. I mean, at this Mm -hmm. point, I mean, I grew up outside of Chicago in the suburbs and moved away to Georgia for college. And since I left and over the past, I guess, 15 years or so, all of my cousins who I grew up with in Illinois, we now basically are on all the coast. I have cousins Mm -hmm. in Colorado and Washington state. I have a cousin in California. I have a cousin out in DC. I have cousins who are still in the Midwest but are not in Illinois. Of course, there's Michigan and there's, um, Wisconsin, there's Wisconsin. Right, and then yeah. at one point, one of my cousins was down in Florida for a bit. My grandparents both retired to Florida. And so that was a trend that you know, took people away from the immediacy of being together um, in that location. And so that's really the experience that, that I have had personally. And so you, you see that start to to increase over this time period as well. And so you have all these things that are shaping the way people are in communities. And that doesn't even begin to talk about the impact of things like TV and media and just that the rise of consumerism during this time. So we're going to shift gears and talk about that because that is such a huge part of, of some of this too. And so, you know, you have, especially in the 1950s, you know, you, you had radio and that was already part of part of society. You had TV, but they became so much more commonplace. And so anytime something is commonplace and easily accessible to the masses, it starts showing up in homes. And there was that book that, um, that you mentioned all the time, and what was it called? Amusing ourselves to death Mm -hmm. that talks about really this trend of how we're, we're teaching ourselves to exist in our homes and be consumed by the media that we have access to. And so you see some of this start to really intensify over these couple of decades. And so that leads to um, just higher rates of consumerism. You know, advertising goes through the roof and it's just everywhere and starts infiltrating the way that we think, the way we behave, the way we interact with one another. It starts creating this this instant gratification mindset that that life is about catering to my needs and, and what I need as an individual. And it starts really saturating us as a society. Um, and then of course with that, you have the intensifier of all of the technology that we, that we have these days too. And so you see that just, I mean, accelerate all of that trend as well, especially in the past two decades with the rise of social media. And so we just have these societies that are um, just being so impacted by that. Yeah. It's, it's funny to think of uh, Neil Postman wrote, I'm using ourselves to death in 1984. There were four channels. You know, there were four national broadcast channels. Yeah. There was no internet. There, there was, I'm pretty sure ESPN had started, but no one had ever heard of it. No one had cable in their house yet at that point. So it's, and um, another another book, kind of dystopian, where people would sit around watching TV was Fahrenheit 457, mm. 451? 51, yeah. And they, uh, and they talk about, the author talks about walking around and seeing the blue light coming. Mm-hmm. And then again, this is written, they couldn't have comprehend smartphones, mm-hmm. which, which again, technology is good. We're sitting here talking into a little microphone with a with a computer in front of us, and and that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, the distraction of TV now, and or not even just TV, internet, everything, all the technology. Uh, it's just you know, it, it's it's just it's wild. They couldn't have imagined. That. One of my things I think is interesting is Netflix, and the invention of uh, the word binging. Mm-hmm. On TV didn't really exist till about ten years ago when they did the auto, yeah. like they just started playing the next thing, and so people just they're like, okay, well, this is playing. Yeah, I'll just, I'll everyone's guilty sitting, of I'll that just these keep days. Here. <laughs> I don't think there's one person who can say they haven't binged a show at some point. 
But yeah, and that's one that, you know, when, when you think about, it, gosh, especially the past 10 years in particular, the way that social media and internet and things like that, there's there's such a, a promise with technology for greater connectivity. I mean, it's it's helped it's helped with globalism and our ability to, to have, you know, a, a global society, a global economy. There's been a lot of benefits to it, but it comes at a cost in some ways. And so it, it promises these elements of connectivity and community. And I think one of the biggest ways that we've seen that is with social media, mm-hmm. having a promise of connection. And, and I think we are safe to say that over the past couple of years, some of those those gaps and what it offers have really come to the forefront, um, especially during some of the, of the recent years. We've we've lived through the the COVID pandemic, which we'll talk mm-hmm. about um, in a later episode. But we've really seen the ways in which it doesn't provide that, but it, it gives you that illusion of that. And so the way that we've started to wrap ourselves around uh, social media as our primary community in many ways has really been an intensifier for some of that. So we have all that happening really over, you know, just the span of what, 70 years or so that we just tried to wrap up in like 15 minutes. But during this time, so many of the things that we're experiencing and we, you know, we experienced as a country during those times were also present within the church. And so we're going to switch now and talk about the decline of community during this time, specifically through the lens of the church. And we're going to start by looking at the mainline church in particular, which for anyone who may not know, I'm going to have Kevin walk us through what that is. And we're going to start from there and then talk about how that's kind of gone over the past couple decades too. Yeah, mainline may have a confusing sound to some of these people because if I told you who's in them, um, you would say, I've never heard of some of those or those are really small. Why is this? You know, it's it's going to be Methodist, which most people probably heard of. They're probably the largest behind Baptists. I believe they're somewhere 9, 10, 12 million people. Uh, and then Episcopalian Church, you probably heard of that one. And I say Lutherans, but a lot of people don't know there are three Lutheran denominations out there. And um, so the one that, you know, I'm drawing a blank on their exact name, but they're only about one million people. And, you know, just as a reminder, currently the Southern Baptist Convention has been losing people for maybe a decade or so, and they're well over 30 million. So the main line is going to be Episcopalian, Lutheran, Presbyterian, but it's, again, right now there's about five Presbyterians, and the largest one has maybe a million. So, uh, But they, they kind of all split um, for different reasons, mostly coming out of um, the fundamentalist controversy of the 20s and onward, where there's kind of some liberalism and, and some social gospel versus fundamentalism and retreating, and then... And this could be a whole thing, so we won't dive too much in this. Uh, you know, you had Billy Graham and the evangelicals, and so really they just they started splitting. But the thing about these mainline ones is they really had the parish model, and that was you know you, you and of course Catholics still have this, and, and these these people still have it too. It's just lesser. Again, you got to think back. You're in an ethnic enclave. Your your dad, your granddad, their whole all of them were in a you know German immigrant part of Chicago. So uh, they were, you know, Lutheran. So they went to the local Lutheran church. There was no thought of going to any other churches. uh, And they wouldn't have driven to another suburb to go to another church. And they would have seen all the same people there. And what we we see these declining, partly because they take on liberal kind of theology and a downplaying of Christ and the cross. Um, You know, they deny resurrection and and the virgin birth and all those. And again, that's a whole whole different topic but you know they're basically not offering anything like i'm not sure why you would go to a church like mm-hmm. this and a lot of people agreed so people started leaving um, because they're not really offering a theology or if anything but also with that suburbanization now your dad you know leaving that part where he grew up which was kind of mixed with the polish with your mom whereas you know the two of them and you know their parents had grown up in the city now all of a sudden they shoot way out and there may not even be a church there yet there may be suburbs and things popping up, or there's just one local, maybe Baptist church, mm-hmm. and you think, oh, I'm not Baptist, I'm Lutheran, or I'm Catholic, or what is non-denominational? So, yeah, this is really the rise of the non-denominational church as well, as some of those, as some of that model, the parish model, went away. And so, you know, you have all these denominations that are declining in church membership and church attendance, and so we enter this era of churches trying to reclaim some of this, and so all those things that you were just saying, you know, are happening along the way across the board in these denominations. And so we we start this era of what we're going to call the, the consumer-driven church model, which is sometimes called seeker-sensitive. It goes by a couple of different names, but essentially the church starts 
marketing itself in a sense and trying to attract people using more of the cultural elements around us. And, you know, and we talked about this again in preparing that things like the non-denominational church, because they weren't in this parish model, they wouldn't have a cap on how many people could come to their church. And so then you started seeing these explosions of mega churches that had fancy lights and all this crazy sound equipment and you have big bands and these emotional experiences that were that were catered to attract people into the services. And so you really have this, um, this time of church becoming a product. It really attached itself to the consumer-driven movement that we talked about as well during this time in society. Mm-hmm. That we became a, you know, we became a product of the things that were marketed to us. So you would see, you would see marketing of something, and you would say, "Oh, I want that," and you would go to this church because it had something that you desired specifically, and whatnot, because it was great mm-hmm. biblical teaching, but because the music was something you particularly liked. And yeah, so there were there are lifestyle churches. Uh, what, what's his name? Who did the purpose-driven life? Uh, Rick Warren. Rick Warren, yeah. He he started his church out, and his idea was like, oh, we're laid back. We're Southern California. I'm not going to wear a tie. I'm going to wear a Hawaiian shirt, mm-hmm. and which is fine. You don't have to wear a tie to church. I don't wear a tie to church. That's that's not my point. But my point was it, it was part of – maybe he just really likes Hawaiian shirts, and I'm too cynical. But <laughs> <laughs> part of – I mean, Hawaiian shirts aren't nice. But he – that's his market. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm not the dodgy, stiff, you know, educated, you know, uh, parish model. We're going to do litur- uh And you'll talk about more of the liturgy in a minute. But they dropped a lot of the, the liturgy they'd grown up with and the call and the repeat and sitting in pews and mm-hmm. doing choir music and hymnals. And, and we're just going to relax and we're going to drop some mm-hmm. and move into uh, – to kind of what people know now. What what are some of the things that? Yeah, I mean that that's kind of where the the worship wars, as they would be called, started with some of just the music differences alone. But churches just started doing all different ki- kinds of things to cater to those who were coming, more like they were putting on a show for people than mm-hmm. actually putting together a worship gathering to glorify God. And so this is the rise of celebrity pastors and worship leaders, and and you know all about uh, all about that, and less and less about participation, and more about enjoyment, and entertainment across the board. And not, again, not every church fell prey to this, but a vast majority of them have within the contemporary American mm-hmm. Christian church. And, and and we know historically, real quick, there were mega churches, there were celebrity pastors, but it, but it wasn't the model. Like yeah. Charles Spurgeon is famous because so many pe- people came to see him. He was a celebrity and is notable in history. Like, so, so don't add us. We know. What our point is, mm-hmm. when this became the goal. Mm-hmm. And so you, you take that and you add it to the things that were already happening with people, you know, moving away from their families, moving outside the, the, the center of their communities. You have less stability within your congregations. People would come for two years and then leave and move and take a job somewhere else and they'd move across the city. And so, like, there, there wasn't mm-hmm. the same kind of commitment to even a church community. So you have that at play along this time, too, with all the things like geographic mobility and suburbanization. And, you know, we when we were younger and we were first looking around for a church, we encountered the term church shopping even. And so mm-hmm. there'd be times when we would pass 12 churches on the way to the church that we attended. Mm-hmm. And I think that became a thing, too, because you would go to the church that you preferred Sometimes for good biblical reasons, but other sure. times it's because they had better music and better experience. And well, so, in, in context for people who maybe aren't in the Bible Belt. That's true. Because <laughs> you, you grew up driving farther than we've ever driven for church, and you didn't pass a true, church. True, but I didn't pass any, so, yeah. Or I so, passed like one. Right there, <laughs> Whereas yeah. like here you pass about 12. Yeah, the Catholic Church and the Protestant, yeah. So, so anyway, I mean, that's it's a it's a... A lot of things that were happening during this time, but a lot of a lot of what the, the church ended up experiencing paralleled a lot of what happened within society. And so the reason that this became our, our second topic was because before we talk about where where church is headed and what the church should really be in this time moving forward, it's important to understand this. So, you know, for the for the sake of both of us and all of our listeners, I think it's I think it's critical to put into context why this in particular is important to us and why should we care. So, Kevin, what what about this to you is the most important takeaway? Yeah, so, you know, as, as hopefully we're, we're tying everything together, you're seeing, you know, people aren't growing up and living, you know, you're not born and living in the same town, you're not dying in the same town, so you got the mobility, you got the suburbanization, um, you have church attendance just dropping, and you have these other less committal ones, and in the reason, and so that's where we are now as a, as a church, and the reason we started with society, though, is... You know, we're clearly now in 2021, uh, we, we are a post, we're a post-Christian society. I 
believe that I and I'm drawing a blank on it. I just saw the other day that it's either either just happened or um, is expected to happen within the next couple of years. But the number of people who even claim Christianity is likely to drop to, to that 50 percent mark. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it was maybe it was white people in America. It's already dropped to the 48, 49 percent. So it's it's declining. It's and you know I always think about a cartoon. I saw a little um, almost like a political cartoon drawing. Uh, a few years ago where he points to, you know, the 50s or whatever it was. you got three guys, you know, one, two of them are standing and saying, um, kind of on the Christian side, and one says, you know, I believe in Christianity, and the other says, oh, it's culturally valuable for me to be here. And then the other side, yeah, guy said, I don't like Christianity. And we've switched to that guy in the middle now is standing on that other side. Mm-hmm. And so I think Christianity is, is going to be – just not it's certainly never well we never know you know praise god maybe maybe to be like the 50s again maybe that'll it'll be ubiquity i I don't see that happening we we could have another great awakening who knows and and we we pray for that obviously but most likely it's going to get smaller and smaller i mean right now i think the statistics for daily church daily weekly church attendance is is somewhere in the 20s so so it's already pretty low and people who go monthly is something like 40 30 40 percent something like that so we're declining so so we're we're kind of you know in the 50s we kind of had it close to like we said back in in the early syncretism with with the church and and now the society's moving away and we're splitting mm-hmm. and that makes a lot of people afraid they wonder what are we going to do and what we tried to do in this episode and, and the last one is is point out like We've been here before. We've seen it all. We've seen ourselves be the official religion. We've seen ourselves be the persecuted religion. And, and mm-hmm. Christians are persecuted around the world right now. And it's it's the official religion in some countries, but that's meaningless. I mean, that's some countries in Europe, it's official, and the attendance is 2-3%. Mm-hmm. So I guess my takeaway would be, you know, it's not something we have to fear, but it's something we need to be aware of. It is declining, but there's something we can offer. Yeah, I, I love that. And one of the things that... I think for me, it's one of the bigger takeaways is that for people like us in this current generation, we have grown up potentially not knowing anything different from this experience, mm-hmm. specifically in this conversation within the church, that the consumption model that we have we have grown up in, that we've experienced, that we are probably living out in different ways is really all we've had. And so we don't know it can be different. And therefore, our minds, in a sense, are just set that this is how it is. And until you can back up from that and know that, no, that's not the case. It hasn't always been like this. And know the factors that have contributed to that. Until you get to that point, you really will have a hard time actually stepping in and shaping it into what it can be. Because you won't have that knowledge of where we came from to know where we can shift to. And I sit in this conversation very excited and encouraged about the potential for the church to step in in these moments and and begin to shape and reshape what our our Christian community, in particular our biblical community, our church communities, look like in the future. And I'm really excited to talk about that next time. So that's probably a good place to to stop for today because we're yeah, have so, a lot of good stuff for next. So time. much more to say, but <laughs> it's, it's uh, probably always the problem with these. Trying to keep them short. We are, ish. but we 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 do. We're excited um, that you've been joining us for this. We hope you enjoyed the content today. We hope you will also join us next time as we talk about the future of community. And if you enjoyed this, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe to the Modern Cloister podcast. You can also find us online at moderncloister.com. You can send us comments. You can send us questions. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at uh, moderncloister at gmail.com, too. You can now. So we have, we have an email up, address, so, so all that's we're good. Legit. <laughs> you- uh, find Chris on Twitter at – are you just Chris Turner? I am just Chris Turner on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram, and you are on Twitter. Yes, I'm, Kevin I'm on Twitter. The You'll, Kevin Turner. The Kevin Turner. Do not get confused to any other Kevin Turner. No, not, out there. not a Kevin Turner. <laughs> you know, none the of those Kevin things. Turner. But we, we invite you to connect with us and we look forward to chatting next time.